Greetings everyone, this is the Recovering Theist here. I'm coming to you with another vlog. I'm still trying this thing out, not sure if it's something I want to do or not, but it's a way for me to do daily uploads to the channel um, and, you know, try to make sure that the channel stays relevant. Like, this is really just a side project for me. Something I've wanted to do for a while and uh, hopefully something that will work out. But, uh, right now it's just i'm playing around with it new to a bunch of the technology that goes with it and uh, it'll take some time for me to get accustomed to it since this isn't my full-time job i've uh, got a full you know 40 plus hour a week full-time job uh, spouse kids so this is something i can only do in my very limited spare time but hopefully it'll be of some use to somebody um Today I really wanted to just quickly talk about um, January 27th uh, is the anniversary of the Apollo 1 fire. Um, as Roosevelt said, it's the day that we'll live in infamy. And um, of course Roosevelt was talking about uh, Pearl Harbor. But this day will equally live in infamy. Um, it's the first time NASA lost um, astronauts. And they lost them on the pad. I mean, this wasn't even a, a launch. The vehicle wasn't fueled. It wasn't scheduled to launch for a, at least another month, or about another month. It was, it was sometime in late February um, that it was scheduled to launch. And um, because of a design flaw, which basically, if I remember correctly, basically our oxygen that we have in the normal atmosphere is about 20% of the overall makeup of the atmosphere. The rest of it's nitrogen and some other stuff. And so they pressurized the cabin um, with pure oxygen at about uh, at, the, at the 20% levels, but it was nothing but pure oxygen. And pure oxygen in those high pressure environments is extremely combustible. And um, there was electrical fire that caught some stuff on uh, some other stuff on fire pretty readily because of the oxygen environment and uh, because of the high pressure of the uh, command module the astronauts couldn't get the door open and they burned to death um, tried to get out but they uh, they couldn't and uh, those three astronauts were Gus Grissom who was a veteran all the way from back to Mercury, the Mercury program, um, and his first mission, um, uh, the Liberty 7. It sank to the bottom of the ocean. He almost drowned uh, because the escape hatch blew off and flooded the, uh, the cabin. <laughs> and he almost drowned because he was still in his, in his uh, spacesuit. So um, he, he passed... Uh, pilot Ed White and Roger Chafee and it was Roger Chafee's um, or is it Chaffee? I think it's Chaffee is how it's pronounced. Um, it was his first mission. It was Ed White's I think second and it was or it was going to be Ed White's second and I think it was going to be Grissom's third because he had flown on Mercury. He flew in Gemini and he flew he was going to fly in Apollo and um a lot of people agree he might have been um, the first man on the moon. He, um, I'm pretty sure he was the the only he was the senior uh, of of basically all the astronauts still active. He was a senior astronaut, and um, he, uh, uh, excuse me, I take that back. Alan Shepard was still active. He had been uh, grounded during Gemini, uh, but uh, he ended up uh, walking on the moon. Um, but I think at the time, uh, Alan Shepard was still grounded, and so he was still he was the senior astronaut at the time. And a lot of people think he would have been uh, the first man on the moon. Alan Shepard had, I think, an inner ear issue. There was something that it took some tug of war back and forth between him and NASA to get him uh, flight certified again. But anyway, anyway uh, back to Apollo 1. Um, it's the first real wake-up call for NASA. And um, 
it's a testament to the danger these guys uh, face before they ever get into space. Um, this wasn't considered a high risk test. The vehicle wasn't fueled. Um, and it's just one of those things that logic should have won out the day. People should have thought about this, but because we were doing so many new things at in such a short period of time, at such a rapid rate, these types of things were bound to happen, and we're very lucky that they didn't happen uh, after this. Um, the Saturn V was the most uh, complex machine ever built, and there never was a failure of one, and just, just the, the odds of that are astronomical. So, I mean, we really got lucky uh, that these three brave men were the only ones we lost during the Apollo time. And, of course, we lost two shuttles, um, Challenger and Columbia. And the Russians had a couple different missions that they lost. And, of course, I can't remember their names. Their, the Russian names are hard to remember. Um, but all these men, Soviet, American, whoever, um, these men are the best of the best. Um, I grew up with these men being uh, heroes and I've had the good fortune of meeting several astronauts and they're all, ex they've all been extremely intelligent um, and they've been uh, very kind and gracious people but you can always tell there's something, something different about them. And it's not in a bad way but it's just They've got that special, extra special sauce that makes them have the right stuff where the rest of us, you know, don't have the right stuff. Um, so anyway, I wanted just a short vlog. It's probably going longer than, longer than I wanted it to go. Commemorating these guys and uh, the sacrifice that led to Americans... Um, making it and being the first country to put, put a man on the moon. Um, we like to remember uh, the, the success of the Apollo program, but up until the success of the Apollo program, the Soviets were, were beating us hands down. Um, first man in space, first woman in space, first spacewalk, uh, first orbital rendezvous, first uh, quote-unquote space station, first landing on the moon, first landing on Venus, uh, they've, they, uh, they really, uh, they were beating us in, in, in most every way that it can be, to, you know, judged, but we made it to the moon first, we put men on the moon, and no matter what some crazy kook of a denier may tell you, uh, we landed on the moon, the video you saw was the video from, of Neil Armstrong um, walking on the moon and there's reasons why it doesn't look as good as maybe it should um, main reason being that the video was being received by a uh, station a receiver in Australia because of the way the orbits lined up and the rotations lined up and they didn't have the equipment to uh, receive and record the signal properly um, um, basically, it wasn't because they had subpar equipment, it was just because it was incompatible with what NASA was using. And so they ended up having to point a uh, video camera at the screen and then record it and push it out to the rest of the world. So it's, it's one of the worst recordings you possibly could have, and it's a shame because it's, 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 it's something that we can't get back. Um, we wish we had it, but just a lot of people didn't think that Apollo 11 would make it to the moon and be a success. I mean, it was the first full, you know, all go mission. Apollo 10, you know, didn't have the fuel to land. Um, and then you go back from there that there was never a full all go mission to go land on the moon and walk. Apollo 11 was the first try and we did it. And they didn't think we would do it. Um, and it's well known that Nixon had another speech planned. That if they couldn't get off the moon, you know, he had a speech plan basically saying those men were going to die there. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, these guys are just amazing. And Gus Grissom, I mean, he, everything I've read about the man, he was, he was like the astronaut's astronaut. Um, you know, a lot of people will, will say that, you know, Armstrong was probably the smartest and, you know, there, there's all these different ones that they assigned to the people who walked on the moon or especially, the, you know, if you go back to the, the Mercury 7, there was this one, this one, this one. Um, Gus Grissom was the one that everybody, you know, looked up to and respected um, the most. I'm not saying the other guys weren't, but he was kind of the astronaut's astronaut. And uh, it was a great loss to the space program to lose these three brave men. And in the way we lost them, um, but they gave their lives in service to a greater good, a greater mission. And that mission was push, putting forth uh, the ability for, for America to put a man on the moon, for pushing us a space frontier, for taking us to new worlds, literally. So uh, on this day of remembrance, it's something you know, we should never forget. Um, we should always remember these guys. And it's the same with Challenger. And it's the same who uh, Challenger was, was has already passed us uh, this year. And um, uh, Columbia will come a little bit later. So going forward, I want to do this horrible segue into funding. Um, but... We need to try to push our politicians to fund NASA and the level that it should be. And you'll see a lot of space experts say that they don't want the extra funding. They don't need the extra funding. But really what it is, is they're just afraid to come out and say it and, and create a, a storm. But um, we know that the, you know, the, the U.S. government has been in a shutdown for the past uh, or 35 days longest in history and there's been a temporary uh, bill signed to reopen the government for three weeks and then hopefully the government won't close again but they're going to try to negotiate and get us a, a budget to go into the new year and this is the crucial time to email right your congressman um, your, your representative and your senator to try to make sure NASA gets as much money as possible, to make sure that NIS gets the as most money as possible, the NIH gets as much as much money as possible. This kind of stuff is important. Scientific research is important. Uh, pushing the frontier of whatever particular uh, uh, agency we're talking about is important, and this is the time to do it. This is the time to make sure they get good funding the next year. And NASA's current budget budget is somewhere about twenty and a half billion dollars, which was more uh, than what they asked for last year. And let's hope that continues. Let's hope they continue to fund um, the rover missions. Uh, let's hope they continue to fund the climate research, which is for some reason is becoming a big uh, contentious topic, and will continue to be a contentious topic. But let's hope they fund uh, the rovers. Let's hope they fund deep space research. Let's hope they fund SLS and push forward to a new into a new year. So, uh, in closing, uh, this uh, vlog is not something that I'm necessarily high quality. It's not something I really you know, expect a lot of people to listen to, but it's something that I, I want to do to kind of get used to using this equipment, used to. Uh, putting up something every day and also I've got the one video up of, of deconstructing Genesis and I want to do a whole series and if I get if I'm lucky and have the the the, the, the support comes from YouTube I'd like to go through the entire Bible but it's just something that take time, takes time um, I have very limited time especially during the week and um, I want to do it it's something I've really felt like I should do, um, but it's just, it's the time. And hopefully I've got something uh, unique to contribute. Hopefully it's something that somebody somewhere will uh, get something out of and um, we'll continue to push forward. 
and hopefully tomorrow I'll have something else. I've got some stuff I want to talk about, but um, I just got to find a way to put it into words. I don't want to go in here and do a lot of uhs and uhs like I have been doing, but that's something I feel strongly about. So I'm still working on episode two of Deconstructing Genesis. Um, maybe going, maybe sticking on one verse, maybe going through a couple more verses. I really don't know until I kind of get my outline and, and go through, but um, just trying to deconstruct the language and make sure that everything that I kind of retained from the, my time I spent in the church, in the fundamentalist church, uh, fundamentalist, evangelical, whatever you want to call it, um, to make sure other people in similar situations have the responses or the critiques to use when they're cornered because I know exactly how it how it feels to be outnumbered yeah, if you can tell by my accent I live in a very conservative uh, part of the country some people call it the Bible Belt and it's especially hard in places like this to be able just just to be respected as an equal whenever you have a different opinion opinion like uh, people that will listen to this podcast. So you have extra work to do. You already start behind the eight ball, so to speak. And it's very hard to get yourself up to where you're even considered an equal in the conversation and not dismissed outright. So that's, that's what I hope the Deconstructing Genesis um, series will um, accomplish. So anyway, until next time, signing off, remembering Apollo 1 and the brave astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. Until next time, this has been The Recovering Theist, and I invite you to keep looking up.